Now, next up, we have Donald Mulligan, who is a DCU lecturer and whose uh, doctoral research looked at Yes Equality's use of Twitter in particular. So I'm actually talking about two things, so I'm going to really speedily use my, my 10 minutes, because uh, in addition to uh, the research that I did on hashtag Marref and how uh, the referendum was discussed on Twitter. I'm also the founder of a campaign called Vote With Us, which was a video-based campaign. So I'm going to briefly talk about that first. And because I'm part of the uh, workshop later on, uh, I'm going to hold some of the, the more technical details and, and kind of suggestions from it till then. So if you're interested in it, by all means, uh, come along to that later on today. Uh, so to begin, Vote With Us was an online social video campaign. And so it was a campaign that was deliberately started to occupy a space that we identified wasn't really uh, being particularly filled at the, the time we set it up, which was to get the personal stories that we've heard time and again were, were so important out there and to get them out there in uh, channels other than the mainstream media and other than ways in which they were going to have to come up against that 50-50 rule that, that Craig just described. It was founded around one very, very simple sentiment, and one sentence indeed, this idea that your particular re reason for voting yes might be the very thing that resonates with somebody else, and that each person has their own kind of nuanced reason why they were going to vote, but somewhere else somebody will, will link onto that, and that's the one that's going to connect with them. And so we thought that the best thing we could do is to get as many of those reasons out there, make them as easy to find as possible, and make it as easy as possible for you to add your own reason to that collection of them. And so that's uh, principally what Vote With Us was about. So of course, shared video in the campaign was, was completely central to this. We collected and we hosted all of the videos on votewithus.org, which is a, a website we developed ourselves for that. And then we promoted them and we distributed them via social media channels, and chiefly Facebook, but we also used YouTube and Twitter and various channels. And something that I'll talk about a little more in the, the workshop is the appropriateness of certain social media channels uh, over others for, for this kind of activity. For us, Facebook made absolute sense for this campaign because people needed to see something remain in their timeline for a while. They needed a space to talk about it. So something like Twitter was good for quickly notifying people that something was there, but it moved too fast for a campaign like ours. And it's a, a problem on a lot of campaigns that judiciously choosing the right sort of channels for you is, it, it can be very, very important. And hopefully we'll speak about that a little later. So driving our campaign via Facebook, we uh, made very explicit calls to action. And we asked people to do particular things we wanted them to. Uh, at the beginning, this was one of the earliest graphics we put up to just support the, the referendum to begin to start talking about it and to encourage others to do the same. And then as it went on, we made very, very specific things. We started counting down the days. We started telling people to canvas to encourage others to uh, talk to their family and friends and to make videos and to share those videos, which became the, the sort of center point of the campaign. So by the time the campaign uh, completed on, the, on voting day, we had hundreds of videos from all around Ireland. We had every county represented. We had all sorts of different themes and family makeups all represented amongst the videos that were there. We had a quarter of a million visits to the site itself. So those were people who came to votewithus.org where you could browse through the videos and indeed find information about how to make your own. But overall, because people were seeing those videos in lots of other channels, in their Facebook feed, on their Twitter, on YouTube, we had uh, about 1.2 million uh, views in total. And of course, a great point part of that 1.2 million is down to these two absolutely fantastic people, Bridget and Patty White, who many people who are familiar with the campaign will know about. Bridget and Patty were a pair of parents and grandparents uh, from County Louth who gave uh, just a very simple, very honest uh, chat about the reason that they were going to vote yes. And they became rightly and justifiably heroes of the campaign for, for lots of people. And in fact, they accepted the award on behalf of the people of Ireland at the, the galas recently. So talking briefly about how that campaign was designed, as I said, uh, basing it around video was important for lots of reasons. Video has a huge advantage in, in social sharing generally. People are more likely to share uh, videos than they are other types of media. Um, so that was a, a kind of a, a useful point for us. But it facilitates greater empathy between people. It's easier to get across a personal story sometimes when you can see the person, when you can read body language as well as hearing uh, what they have to say. But very, very importantly for us, we recognize that at the time that we, we developed this campaign, which was in spring of, of 2014, the ubiquity of the tools and the familiarity that people had with the platforms for using them had reached a, a critical mass in Ireland. The Ice Bucket Challenge showed us that. When we saw that and when we saw the, the uh, numbers of Irish people who got involved in that particular campaign, we knew that we had reached a threshold where Irish people were very, very willing to make videos themselves, to upload it. They were familiar enough with how to use the, the tools they had and how to get it up there. And they had got over that Irish modesty of not wanting to put themselves online, which was all, all valuable stuff that we needed to, to uh, harness. 
And so we knew we needed a, a particular distinct format for this campaign, so we developed a very clear structure around it. So all of the videos had a set opening line, all of them had a, a sort of set of shared brand materials that we gave to people and helped them put it together, and there were uh, quite narrow guidelines, again, which I'll talk about in the workshop, for how people could put things together, and uh, we gave them advice on lengths and stuff like that. Of these things, though, the one thing I want to, to draw attention to now is that set opening line. Every vote with us video began with, my name is Donal, I'm voting for equal marriage, and I hope you'll vote with me. And all of the videos people named themselves made that declaration and asked others to do something with them. And it gave people who were nervous about talking a starting point. It gave them a set thing that they were able to say to just get them going and get that moving. And later, as we reflected on the campaign and people talked to us about it, most people mentioned that, and a lot of older people in particular said that was the thing that was really hard for me to say the first time, to just say on camera, I'm going to vote this way and I hope you do as well, was a starting point. And so giving structure like that within campaigns that you run can be very, very helpful to, uh, to get people involved. We focused on one simple message. We asked people not to mention the myriad different reasons that they might have in their message for voting yes, but just the one that resonates with them the most, uh, going back to our kind of overall design for it. And finally, we very deliberately set a low bar in how uh, we visually presented the videos. So we did not want the videos to be too shiny and beautiful, and as much as I love Vinian's uh, video for the, uh, the campaign that he ran, we didn't want something like that that was going to put off people who are going to film it in dodgy lighting on their phone. We needed people to see that whatever way they did it, the honesty of their story was much more important than the production value of how it looked. And this is something that I've noticed with uh, other com chiefly commercial campaigns that uh, solicit video from the public, is that the examples they give tend to be too shiny and too beautiful for you to feel you could relate to it if you filmed it on your own webcam. And so again, we can talk about that a little bit more later. So to wrap up on Vote With Us, the things that worked for it were the clarity, I think, uh, in uh, it being a simple message that people uh, were, were able to, to get started on because of a set line, and its, its format was a, a fairly clear format, such that people eventually uh, in the campaign came to know what a Vote With Us video meant. There were enough of them out there, and people were familiar enough with the format that asking someone if you were making a Vote With Us video made sense, and they knew exactly what you were talking about in that case. Accessibility of both making the videos and browsing the videos was very important, so we built a site that uh, worked very well on mobile and also let people browse through all of the videos as they started to build up, all those hundreds of videos, by area, by the theme involved, by the amount of people involved, so I could quickly go to the site and find somebody from my home county of Leitrim who's talking about the theme of family, or someone who's talking about parenting from Loud, or whatever it might be. And so that way we let people who are looking for those reasons that they wanted to connect with find them as quickly as possible. We also, as I said, made it uh, something important that you could uh, just honestly discuss why it is that you're voting and that there was no expectation for it to be a fancy or, or a particular format of video. Um, any campaign like this is extremely media friendly to the, the wider uh, media uh, landscape. And so, of course, the videos that uh, we started uh, collecting because of the campaign became in themselves stories that were fed into the national newspapers and into television. They became uh, international stories by the end of it, and Bridget and Patty, of course, were on TV in several other countries by the end of the campaign. And so, so launching something like this can add great uh, wealth of personal and uh, emotive content to a campaign and can circumvent the normal ways of the normal difficulties of getting that into uh, main media channels because this stuff is so good when it's this honest that it will be picked up in that way anyway. So it's a useful format to think about. Finally, it was very important to us to work with the, the wider campaign and we found Yes Equality uh, fantastic to work for in that they were able to uh, guide us on when we would release a particular things. So often we held back content so that we could release it at a time that it was more in line with a particular part of the messaging calendar uh, and a particular theme that Yes Equality were, uh, were espousing at, at different points in the campaign. We also had help from GLAAD in the US who uh, helped us by chiefly by supporting us a lot. They, they had lots of Skype conversations, and when we were doing 10-hour days at the end of it and, and feeling uh, <laughs> very uh, overworked by it, they were very nice in, in just feeling that there was someone else doing this in another country, there was someone in a different context who were doing the same thing as you. But of course, they very helpfully got uh, endorsements and retweets and things like that, so the reason Ian McKellen tweeted about us, for example, was uh, chiefly down to them. Finally, the thing that worked is this. There's this, this one second. See, a little nudge. That's why Vote With Us worked, because it captured those kind of lovely human moments. It was ordinary people who you could recognize. Everybody, when they saw this, saw their own loving grandparents or parents in Bridget and Patty, and they understood from that that these were people who just wanted to talk about the reason that they were voting, and it was uh, an absolutely uh, lovely and human moment, and this, I think, is, is the, the condensing of that. Okay, we've played it too long. She's, she's 
interesting enough. Uh, so I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the research for, for about three minutes, but uh, before that, as I said, I'll come back to, to this topic and indeed to, to more specific information on it in uh, workshop number six later. And votewithus.org still contains the entire back catalogue, so all of the archive of videos is there, and all of those archive of videos are now part of the National Library of Ireland as well, so you can uh, access them there as well. So they've become a sort of a, a social document and a record of uh, how people felt about this referendum at the time, which is a lovely uh, thing to have come out of it as well. So I'm going to quickly pitch over to talking about uh, the marriage referendum. Uh, so as I said, I recently completed my uh, PhD, which looked at uh, methods of analysis for uh, how political discussion takes place on Twitter. And one of the major case studies uh, that I used was the marriage referendum, because it was a very good example of that. And so I collected a set of tweets uh, that occurred using that hashtag MarRef between the 30th of January and the 26th of June of last year. There's a, a, just over a quarter of a million of them uh, from about 80,000 people. And so several things are important in this, and several things are useful for this conference, I think, because they're, they're good things to reflect on for other campaigns that you might be trying. So how people uh, tag their tweets is very, very important. Uh, once I, I got into to running this research, I discovered very early on that there were lots of competing uh, hashtags that described the, the referendum. There was hashtag marriage equality, hashtag SSMREF, but there were different reasons why people used certain uh, ones and not others. Of course, no, no people on the no side use hashtag marriage equality because it makes a statement about the event that they did not want to make. But hashtag SSMREF was interesting because it was suggested as a good official uh, name for the, the referendum, and it follows a convention that lots of Irish political tweeting follows. It stands for same-sex marriage referendum. But interesting, uh, interestingly, a lot of people on the yes side thought that SSMREF sounded too much like SSMREF, and they, they felt that there was a negative co connotation. And so most yes people completely avoided this hashtag. And so if you were to go by what the official tag should have been and collect a date on this, you would have found that it's very wrong. And so it's very important if you're looking at a campaign, if you're designing a hashtag yourself, that you think about that neutrality in it if you want to get more people talking there. And when you go back to study it later, you think about ways in which people might be included or excluded from particular sets of data that you're looking at. The profile of the people who tweeted was also very interesting. About 88% of the people in the, the set I collected have used that only incidentally, they only use it once. But the top 1% of users are responsible for almost half of the stuff that's there. So there is a small cohort of people who are driving a lot of this. And so we know from our, our own uh, kind of intuitive ideas of, of how online communities work that that's probably the case. How people talk to one another about it is also very different uh, to other studies. And so uh, this is our, our sort of a, our broad uh, graph of how the, the uh, conversation on Twitter happened over time, and you can see that the giant spike takes place on the count day. So we start rising towards it as people talk about going to vote, but then as the results start coming in, the hashtag absolutely explodes. And so though it looks small, that initial part is still in the thousands, and those initial spikes are several thousand people, uh, and all of those spikes, by the way, correspond to debates that happened on, on TV and various other things like that. Here's a breakdown of the 50 most frequent contributors. These are the people who talked about the marriage referendum most. And so on the left, this is their stance with regard to it. And you can see that the pro and against the yes and no side actually is very close to what the final result was. Um, and we can see on the, the right, these are when I coded all of the people, when I looked at who it was that talked about it in the first place, most of the people were just ordinary citizens. Most of the people in the entire set, of course, are ordinary citizens, but also most of the most frequent contributors, the people who talked about it most, these 50 people, were also ordinary citizens. This was very, very unlike all of the other uh, studies that we've looked at in how politics gets discussed online. In this case, uh, citizens really led uh, the, the, <coughs> the discussion. So I'm not going to go into the scary formula, but I'm going to tell you that there's a, um, a a kind of metric that's very, very useful. When we have a set of people and we have identified them by groups, we can use a thing called EI index, which basically gives us a number between minus one and one, and that tells us at minus one, those people only talk to people like them within their group. At one, they talk to only people unlike them outside of the group. And so we can rate the different groups and we can see, did people communicate with one another in particular ways? And so, for example, we can see that citizens uh, happened to uh, be more likely to talk to one another than they were to talk to, to other people within uh, the, the marriage ref set. And so when we look at this, we can see that citizens actually not only represent the most people in it and lead the discussion, but they also talk in a very, very different way than they do for other kinds of political events. So I looked at the local elections in 2014 and the general election this year, and in both of those cases, the marriage referendum is different. People fundamentally uh, adopt a different way of talking about political events when there are social issues like this. They move towards being led by activists and being led by citizens, and they move away from the traditional power structures. And this is a huge opportunity for you as activists or you as leaders of this to uh, facilitate that and be involved in that, and it's something that's a big uh, and important finding of this. 
Uh, although there were mostly yes people in the overall cohort of tweets, at that top level it was split about 60-40 as, as I showed there. So the no side was well represented in terms of volume, but by a small amount of people. Essentially there were a small amount of no people saying an awful lot during the, the course of this. And among the most shared uh, content, a huge amount of it was just uh, people sharing information, of course, about uh, the, the final counts. But 30% of that entire section of most shared content was parody and humor and satire. And this is very important. Of that 30%, all of it emerged from the yes side. So all of the fun in the, <laughs> the top part of it was on one side. And there's a very good reason for this. We saw tweets like this uh, early on. This is uh, from, from Marco Halloran, who was uh, talking about <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Um, the reason that these exist is once I, I interviewed people and, and uh, spoke to them uh, about why the, this was why satire was so important was that many many people felt that they needed something uh, that diffused and undid a lot of the tension that they were feeling and a lot of the the, the bullying and a lot of the the problems that uh, were coming up when they were hearing the the fair balanced fifty fifty stuff on the radio and they were hearing people calling them disordered and and defective and dangerous as as this participant uh, talked about here. So social media can become the channel for uh, for that for diffusing these kind of tensions that are, are very, very dangerous and very problematic for, for people. And it's a space that uh, we can very easily occupy. So as I said, to finish up, the relevance to this really is that Twitter is likely to be a very, very important source of citizen-led discourse on social issues. So if you're talking about social issues, it's a place that you should uh, take a look at and you should help to uh, create leading roles in. The choice of uh, hashtags that you use is very important for more reasons than it just being a specific, unique hashtag. There's also issues of neutrality and of emotive feeling towards it and whether people will use it or not. And that's something that, to consider if you're designing a campaign yourself. Things about Twitter, it's affordances, as we call them in, in the media theory area. The fact that you can direct conversation, the fact that you can very speedily get responses, the fact that it's brief and succinct, all of these things make it very, very useful for talking about politics. But all of them also make it very, very useful for humorous and parodic and satirical content. And so there's space for that there, and people are looking for that there and identifying that as an important uh, thing that they want. And during and post uh, campaigns, analysis of Twitter can give you a very good idea of where the discourse is going, um, but there are important caveats, of course, and again, I can talk about these later or with any of you who want to uh, come up to me during lunchtime. Obviously, the people on Twitter are not the same as the wider population. Obviously, we need to take into uh, account those kind of things. And it's very, very important, I think, as well, to inform some of this by qualitative methods, by doing interviews and focus groups along with it. But overall, it's a source of data that can be extremely useful to you, and it's an area, a channel of conversation that, particularly on social issues, I think could be very, very relevant for, for many people at the conference. Uh, so again, you'll find me on Twitter there. You can email me, or you can come and grab me during lunchtime, as you see fit. Thank you very much. <laughs>